Hello? Well, uh, what about some bio code after lunch? Yeah, that sounds okay. good, really. Okay, uh, so I will put a disclaimer. Uh, the yeah, presentation contains white code. Because the first time I did the presentation on white code, on the first slide with white code, some people left. So, <laughs> Uh, let's, well, I'll introduce a bit myself. I work for AXA, I think it's quite well known here in France. Uh, but I'm not from here, I'm from Barcelona. In Barcelona, we have one of the mobile uh, development centers, let's say. Uh, I've been writing two books about Android. Uh, I've been speaking in several conferences about uh, bytecode as well and custom views. And all my, let's say, obsession for performance, uh, low level bytecode assembly, it comes from the, from the demo scene. I mean, also took part in the JavaScript 1K competitions. I was the runner-up two years ago, and this year I just got an honorable mention, but yeah, that's something that's good. So let's talk about Java and bytecode and Android. So everything starts with the JAR compiler. So we know we've got all nice tools, Android Studio, everything, but everything starts with the JAR compiler. Why? Because from Java, we need the Java C compiler to get our class files, <coughs> okay? Or on Android, you get one step further, uh, it was Java, Java C, and then the class files were converted into the X file. Got to be why is there on the on on the virtual machine itself on on Dubic, It was converting on the desktop, was optimizing the X file, and then on Art, it was next to out converting to native. But Google said the change was coming. Uh, Jack and Jill, who remember Jack and Jill? Who used Jack and Jill in production? Okay. Uh, so yeah, change is not coming anymore. At least not this change. But the idea was from Java file, go to Jack, and Jack get to the next one. Which, okay? But change is still coming. So we got D8 and R8. Anyone is using D8 already? Uh, no, you have to enable on your Gradle file, otherwise it's not enabled. Okay. I see a saw hand here. Are you using a production? Nope. Okay, so the DA is uh, it's still compiled with Java C, and then uh, D8 or R8 is basically getting the class file and getting into the X file. So they both accept, uh, if I'm not wrong, class files, DEX files, Z, mm, R, AAR, JAR, whatever. So uh, R8 is more, let's say, the, uh, it's the obfuscation, the, the minifier, let's say, and D8 is the, the DEX. Okay, but let's focus on Java C, because everything, as I said, everything starts on Java C. So what's the difference between Java C and the other compilers? So compilers, they produce optimized code for the target platform. So they know where they're compiling to, so they're optimizing specifically for that platform. Java C, it doesn't actually produce optimized code. So just put a star. There was, uh, on some versions of Java, there was a uh, um, dash O, I don't know how you use it, the option to optimize. But you saw it uh, on, you disassemble, Let's say a bit uh, the compiler, you the source code of the compilers, now the option doesn't do anything. So Basically, because Java C doesn't know where it will be run or executed. So if you look for Oracle, basically it runs on 3 billion mobile phones, in 5 billion Java cards, and some TVs, Blu ray, and everything. So basically, for this reason, Java is just a bytecode, it's very simple, and uh, all operations are stack based. I don't know if you've had one of those calculators, you, you uh, put everything on the stack and then you all do the operations, then it's the same thing. It's very easy to interpret, really easy. Uh, it's not assuming anything on the, on the target machine, uh, but also it's not the most performing solution ever. So let's do one quick example. Imagine we want to do this operation, very simple, okay? So we look at the bytecode, okay? It's quite easy, it's loading one element, loading the other one to the stack, adding them together, and that puts the result back on the stack, and then it stores what is on the stack on the variable. Okay, so for one addition, it's four operations. If you go for a register-based approach, it does the same with just one. So for example, uh, it's just one one addition, or in Intel base, it's just another addition. Okay, let's make things a bit more interesting. Let's just assume that this operation is a bit more complex than before. Let's look at the bytecode. Okay, it's a bit. Uh, Longer, let's say. Uh, here is the mapping of the local variables. So you can see uh, i is on one, j is on two, k is on three. And if we go step by step, sorry. Yeah. Uh, he is loading uh, j and j and i, adding them together, skipping that in the stack. Then it's loading k, adding them to the previous result and keeping the result in the stack. Same thing with uh, w. 
Here it's a bit different. Already it loads five, which five is H. It it loads a constant number two to the stack, multiplies them together, and then adds the result to the previous result. And with the last sentence, it basically it loads two times P, multiplies them together, and then adds them to the previous result, which finally is stores on number two, which is J. Okay, so far so so good. If we do that on a register base, okay, we'll not go to details, but basically that will be one of the mapping size. It's a bit shorter, more concise. So as I said, JVM doesn't doesn't know where the architecture. Uh, sorry, the Java compiler doesn't know which architecture we executed, but the Java virtual machine it does. Okay, uh, here for example, we said uh, in this previous example, we use up to eight registers, but we don't know if we translate that. It, it, the resulting CPU or the CPU where it is actually running this code will actually have eight registers. I don't know your Android, uh, uh, well, uh, as your Android applications, do you split them by architecture? Yes, are you still using MIPS? Okay, my previous company was MIPS, so that's another story. Okay, uh, so all the optimizations are left to be done by the Java virtual machine, so all the hotspot and everything is on the virtual machine, not on the compiler. But from my point of view, and I will say that's my point of view, it takes this concept a bit too far. So let's imagine this uh, very simple C code, okay? Just one variable, ten, and then another integer variable that sums one, two, three, four, five, six, and, and eight, okay? And then just prints the result. Okay, but a step forward. If we compile it with a GCC, well, with a minus O2 compiler optimizations, let's say, it just, okay, I will just print 31. Easy, not a big deal. Uh, in Java C, uh, well, it it doesn't do it that well. So first, it uh, it loads ten and stores it on the on the variable, uh, sorry, on the local variable number one. So that would be eight. Then it loads twenty one, which is basically from here to here. Loads one again, which is the value it just stored, which is ten. Adds them together and stores it back. Okay, so it's not pre-processing, let's say, the, the code. But things get a bit more interesting if we do this change. Okay. We just move the A from the end to, to, here, to here, to before the C. So we use the GCC, okay, 71, not the big deal. And Java C, well, think, uh, here's when things get a bit more interesting. So you can see it loads 10, stores 10 into the local variable, okay, so far so good. Then loads 15, which is from here to here, uh, loads the variable, adds them together, then pushes the 6 to the stack, and adds 6 to the stack. Okay, so uh, since it's only pre-processing from here to here. But what will happen if we do that? Do you think it will be simple? Just add 10 and then add uh, the other numbers? Nope. So uh, I guess as soon as it cannot resolve anything, it's like, okay, we'll solve the pre-processing, so otherwise it's too hard. Uh, I will not go through the code, but you can imagine it's just pushing all the variables and adding them together. Okay, and Android, Jack was there to the rescue, so Jack was actually producing, this is the X bytecode, so he was producing basically that, so that's good. But I tried with D8, and D8 does the same thing. So it orders the operations in a different way, but basically it just, it's a 31, so okay, good. And what happens if we do that on a, on a desktop machine? So we do that on Java, we, we, we know we have the, the just-in-time compiler. So we do that, so we execute, and we look at the resulting assembly code, at the end, it's just that. It's just it's 31, so, okay. So, so far, here's good. Okay, let's talk about language additions. So, you remember from the keynote, uh, Chad talked about uh, autoboxing. Let's take a deeper look into autoboxing. Uh, okay, let's imagine, this is not autoboxing, this is just a normal plain loop. If we look at the bytecode, it loads uh, number one, uh, sorry, number zero, storage in variable number one, okay, which is that will be the, the total. Then uh, it, it loads a zero to the stack, the stores in variable number three, which would be the, the loop counter, let's say. Then here it just loads three, which is the high, which is the counter, then compares with them, and then otherwise jumps on does the loop, okay. And here just to increment the, the counter, quite, quite easy, quite straightforward. And the loop, well, just go to and then checks everything. Okay, we'll look at the internal part, quite easy. Loads the result, loads the, 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 the index, converts it to long, adds them together, and then stores the result again. Okay. But what happens if we do this change? 
and I actually saw that in a production change, so in a production code. And then it's basically what inspired me to see, oh, what's happening there? Okay, if we look at the bytecode from that, uh, we see it gets a bit more tricky, let's say. Yeah, it doesn't fit on the screen, but I didn't want to, to make it smaller, so uh, let's go step by step. So first, it loads to zero, and then it gets a long value of, to basically create a long object out of that. Okay, and then stores, uh, a store, it stores a reference, so it stores an object. Okay, here, same thing, but it, it loads a zero, a zero get, gets the integer value off to get a new integer value, and then it stores it uh, on number two, which is, is i. To compare, loads variable number two, gets the int value from the integer, uh, pushes the end, and then compares with the end. So here, the additional operation is the int value. The loop, nothing, uh, nothing special, just go to like before. And here is when it gets more interesting. Even uh, here, it gets uh, it's getting the long value of the result. It's getting the in value of the index. It's converting to long, adding them together, and then it's creating a new long of the result and storing as a, a storing it as a new long object. To increase is also quite interesting. Before we saw it was just a, an uh, I ink operation. Now it's loading, getting the in value, getting a one, adding them together, and then creating a new integer of the result. And some additional bytecodes, I don't know why they are, they, they are there. So you check, it's just pushing things on the, on, the, on the stack and then just popping them at the end, so. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I tried to, to guess what was that, but I have no idea. Uh, so basically, we looked this code in, in high level back in Java. Basically, this is what it's doing. So I guess you never would write a, a loop like that. And yeah, it, it doesn't have the same impact on now or not than in Dalvik, but it's still it's allocating several several objects. This one and this one are outside of the, of the loop, which is fine. But this one and this one are inside the loop. So if the loop is, is big enough, or it will have an impact on garbage collection and on corruption and uh, not corruption, sorry. Uh, it will trash your memory, basically. So what about DEX? Uh, does Jack or D8 solve the problem? <coughs> no. So it doesn't solve anything. At least not yet. Uh, what about the just-in-time compiler on the desktop? So they have a lot more power there to do it. OK, let's see what happens. Let's run this loop many, many times and see what's the, what's the impact. So we do that with primitives, it takes well, way less time than with using the, the wrapper classes. So here's, I guess, it's the impact with the garbage collection, with everything. So you can see it's, you can notice the difference there. <coughs> okay, but let's try it on, on Android. Let's try it on both, uh, this, I tried it with the same phone, uh, using a, a Talvik virtual machine and Art. So there was an Nexus 5. Uh, with primitives on both Art and Dalvik, yeah, Dalvik is a bit slower, but there's not a big difference. But when using the wrapper classes, there's a huge impact on, on Dalvik. Okay, so it takes a lot of time. I don't know if you're still targeting devices with Dalvik, but at least the virtual machine was really, you can notice it quite a lot. So language editions, my, my advice, use them wisely. You, and I think it's good to know what's going there under, the, under the, the surface, let's say. Okay, let's talk a bit about sorting. And related to, to the same thing, primitives and, uh, and, and wrapper classes. Uh, so not really no white code here at the moment. Uh, so let's try to use to sort some numbers using arrays.sort. Okay. Pretty straightforward. Uh, okay. What would be the difference between sort sorting primitive types and sorting uh, objects, integers? Okay. Basically, the difference is that. Does anyone know why? Yeah. It's basically uh, sorting objects uses a stable uh, sort. So stable sort means that when, when it, to index are already sorted, to keys, let's say, are already sorted, they will prevail in the same, uh, in the same order when, uh, after sorting. But um, Java, I think, for, by default, is using a modified uh, team sort. Well, you can look on Wikipedia. I'm not an expert on sorting algorithms. But, but sorting primitives, it doesn't matter if the numbers are, they stay in the same place or not. So if you have two fives, the two fives doesn't matter if they are one way or the other, they will still be two fives. So for that reason, they is not using a stable sort. So it's using a dual dual pivot quick sort. Okay, so that's a big difference. 
But as you can see, with the number of elements, it grows exponentially. So, so you can you have to sort numbers. Please use uh, inter, you know, primitive types always. Okay. Okay. Let's talk a bit about loops. So here we have a, a quite a standard loop, okay, with using an array list of integers and just looping them with, a, with just with the for getting the size and then getting the, the elements of the array, okay. We look at the bytecode, um, we quickly go through it. Uh, basically, it's getting the list, it's getting the index, getting the arrays list of get, which is basically this, op this operation, uh, checking if an array of integers, if it's actually an integer, better safe than sorry. And converting it to an int, to an int uh, using an int value, converting it to long, then adding them together and store the result. Okay, so more or less what we saw before. Uh, to get the size, basically it was getting the list get, get, and getting an array list of size and then comparing with, uh, with the index. So just one operation, not a big deal. To increment the index, use an uh, incrementation like before. Okay, let's do with the for each. I guess you know what's, what happens here, right? So for each, it seems simple, okay, it's simple, but it's using a, an iterator. So we look, we go here, uh, this for loop basically is getting iterator.next, checking the cast again, if it's an integer or not, uh, in, getting the int value, storing it, and then for looping, it's just uh, calling the, the has next value of the, of the iterator. Okay, so it's more or less the same thing, but it's using the, the iterator uh, interface. To get the result, same operations. Basically, it's loading the, as it stored already the value, so it's just loading them, adding them together, and then storing the result. Okay, what would change if we use an array instead of an array list? Okay, and we can see that the code is a bit uh, nicer, cleaner, maybe, smaller. If uh, we look uh, at the, the addition, it's basically the same thing. Instead of getting the value from the list, it's getting it from the array. And then it's loading. This, is, this loads the, the element from the array, and it converts it again to to an integer, adds them together, and then uh, it's to, uh, sorry, an integer took too long, and then adds them together and, and stores the result. Okay. To get the length, the length of the array, same thing. It's getting the array. Then there's one specific bytecode to get a uh, array length, and then it's comparing the result. As long as the index is smaller, it, it's looping. Okay, as so we can see here, we, we are doing this operation every single time. So let's try to calculate that before the loop. So in this case, we're getting the length out of the loop, okay? And we're just using the, the, the local variable here. So what changed, you can see is a bit smaller. We can change now the, com the, com the comparison of the end loop is just loading two, two values, comparing them together. So it's not, no longer calling a, a method on the, on the array. But as we know for computer science, if we compare with zero, it's always better. What happens if we try to compare with zero? So in this case, let's try to run the array uh, backwards. So at least the comparison is with zero. So we look, the code is a bit smaller, and basically the only thing it does, it just loads a variable, and as long as it's not zero, it jumps. But who knows what might be the issue with running an array backwards? Anyone? You return backwards? Sometimes you, you will hit the last item instead of the first one, so sometimes it's not expected. Uh, no, well, basically you are trashing with the cache. It's when loading the information from the array, it's, uh, I guess, uh, optimized to look uh, forward and backward. Yeah, the cache usually, it, 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 it works, well, depends on the machine or where it's executed, but it works on chunks, and it's getting basically chunks forward, not backwards. Okay. Uh, but yeah, let's see what's the, what's the impact. If we do that in a desktop uh, computer, the only thing, those three, an array with caching the lane or drawing the array backwards, more or less is the same. But when using the list or the for each approach, it takes a bit longer. Okay, I guess with all the overhead, with all the objects, and uh, so it's not actually locating objects, so we need to be careful with that, but it's taking uh, us twice as the other approaches. If we do that on, on Android device, on Nexus 5 still, uh, you can see with using a for each, it usually is a huge penalty. So I don't know, I don't know the reason, but it's actually it's a huge penalty on, on Android the on all the devices. Okay, but we haven't actually done a, a for each loop on, on an array. So 
We can do that as well. So we have an array, and then we can do a for each set analyst in, uh, using a on the array. Uh, so let's go step by step. So as we get a method, we get the let's say the the, the first parameter on the zero on the stack. Okay. Uh, here we love the zero, and we start it on position number one, which will be the result. So we have the result here on position number one. Then it's loading again from the array, and it's starting in the position number six. So we get another instance of the array here. So the same instance, but we have a copy. Uh, it's duplicating the same entry. As you can see, it's loading the array. So it's du duplicating it on the stack. And then uh, it's getting the array length and storing it on five. And then it's just loading a zero and storing on four, which is what we, we use as the, as the array index, as the four index. I get the loop. It loads four and five, so it's a loop index on the right length, and then it's comparing them and jumping back to the loop. Okay, so that's quite normal. Uh, for for the result, so it's it's loading from from six, it's loading the array, it's loading four, which is the index, and then this operation here is loading the, the position, this position of this array, and then it's starting into position number three. So position number three, we got the array index in this case will be zero. Okay, and this operation just is loading one, which is the previous result, loading three, which is what we just store from the array. It's converting it to long, adding them together, and storing them on one. And this operation just simply increases the, the index. So it just okay. It will, it's, for, first of all, it's not scale, so I just got the, the top part of the graph to just to, to make a bit more dramatic. But it's not really a big difference. So from the for each to turning the array backwards, it's just one percent difference. So not really a big deal. But what happens if we run it on a machine with a just-in-time compiler? We can see here it's uh, if we if we go backwards, it's eighteen percent faster. It's uh, I guess we, if we don't have a just-in-time, it really penalizes a lot to actually to have to process bytecodes. So the, the less bytecodes we have, the better. So use arrays as much as you can, use primitives as much as you can. But as, as we saw in this previous example, uh, it was just uh, creating some values. It was uh, actually storing them, loading them again. We can see, well, I've been optimizing assembly code in my lab, so it's something like, okay, you can do it better. So what happens if we do it manually and we optimize the, the algorithm by ourselves? Is it worth it? We will see. So this is the, the original white code, okay? And just by trying to keep things on stack, just not uh, not storing and, and loading things again that is not needed. We reduced it quite a lot. Okay, so let's again go step by step. First of all, we get the array in zero like before. Okay, that not, doesn't change. Uh, then we we load it. We get the array length and we store it on three. So we we're not duplicating again the, the instances of the of the array. There's no need for that. Then we're loading zero as the index, and we're storing it on, on, on local variable number one. Then we just load the zero, and we keep it on the stack. So we don't store it anywhere. OK? This will be used as the result. Here we load zero, which is basically the array. We load the index, which is of one. We get the, the value of that index. We convert it to long, and we keep it on the stack. OK? We have these two values now at the stack. If we add them together, basically what it does, it adds the two elements on the stack and, and leaves the result on the stack. So the moment what we have here is the result of, of the addition. And then we just increment the counter. As you can see here, it's, it's more optimal than before. So the loop is just doing that and keeping always the result here. So then at the end of the loop, the only thing we have to do is basically to store that. But there's no need to store it inside the loop itself. Okay, and for the loop, it's just loading one, which is the index, and loading three, which is the array length, and then just comparing. Okay, so what difference we have in timing? If we have a JIT, basically nothing. It's the same thing. But if we don't have a JIT, yeah, it's a big difference. Okay, so good enough. I think it's around 26%, so it's quite bad. It's quite good, actually. But is it worth it? Well, only in very, very specific cases. And you, uh, it is one of those cases, you're probably using the wrong language. But I mean, you need this to fine tune it so what? Maybe you have to do it in C or native code, basically. And it, basically, it's too much effort as well, and it's quite hard to maintain. 
but actually, T8 or R8 of products, they do some, some stuff in there, so let those tools do it for you. Also, you pay attention to, to the keynote. Uh, Chet also mentioned that there was a penalty on, uh, on calling a method. You remember, it was on all the Rico machines. So, do you think it would be a big difference from this code to this code? Yeah, that's, that's a perfect example of setters and getters. Yeah, that's lovely. Uh, well, yes and no. So basically, the penalty is on Dalvik, as Chet said. I, I got the slide before he said that, to be honest. But yeah, on this machine, there's not, not a difference. On art, it's a, a significant, let's say. Uh, but on Dalvik, yeah, it's a, huge, it's a huge penalty. You have to call methods. And let's changing a bit the gears. Uh, what about strings? The evil plus sign. So, I mean, it's good, it's nice, but uh, it's doing some things uh, underneath. So, okay, this is a, this is a bit extreme, okay? But uh, if we do that, what will happen? Okay, let's look at the white code. Uh, first, well, it's loading a string. It, it's getting the reference. It's storing the reference. Sorry, that's all right. It's standard looping. Just getting the index, storing it as well. Same thing, just getting, a, just getting the, the value we just store, getting in, comparing them, and jumping if required. Uh, just increasing the value, and then here's the interesting part. So here it creates a new string builder, it duplicates the, the same the same methods of, of the string builder, it calls the constructor, so that's the that's constructor of the string builder. Then it's loading one, which one is basically the string we just store. And it's calling a string build dot append, so it's appending with the with the with the string. And then it's loading zero. Oh, sorry, zero is the, the reference of the of the class. Getting the other string, which is this other string we have here. And then just appending that, and at the end, just getting to string and generating a new string, which is stored here. So basically, again, like we did before, we put that in high level. Basically, it's doing that. So it's. Well, I would say not a big deal, but yeah, actually it is. Because if we look from the actual object creation point of view, it's, yeah, he's creating one new string, okay, that's fine. Uh, but here, internally, it's creating one string builder and one string at every iteration of the loop. So what are the alternatives that we have? Okay, we can do it right, but let's look at the other alternatives. Uh, first, using concat. So we can use this, string.concat. Uh, the cost is basically just adding the two buffers of the string and generating a new string. So you can imagine, you can see which is the problem. So it's still creating a new string here. Okay, it's a bit better, but it's still not perfect. Uh, the nice idea is basically using a string builder, but using it in the right way. So just creating the, the object. I mean, that was quite straightforward, but it was just to make uh, to make the point. If we look now at the white code, it's. Here it's only loading the two instances and just create and just calling append, but it's not creating a single object. Internally, it's managing buffers, of course, to make the, the, the string growth, but it's managed internally and it doesn't actually affect the garbage collection. Yeah, I can see what well, it's creating the objects, but it's getting outside the, the loop. Okay, just use it, use it properly, or use a string buffer. You need a thread safe implementation. Another thing that was uh, added. I think Java 1.7 was to use strings in case statements. Is anyone here using strings? In... No, sorry. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, okay, it looks like that. Okay, which is fine, can be good as well. I will not discuss that. But uh, if we look at the bytecode, I don't know, you look at the bytecode that generates. Okay. It's basically doing that. A switch case usually is translated in a. In a, a in a, in a, a lookup switch, bytecode, okay? But here we have two. So we have one lookup switch here and another lookup switch here. You can see here some real long numbers, I will explain now, and here some short numbers, like zero, one only. Why is that? Well, it's easy because it's doing, basically what it's doing is that. So it's uh, getting the hash code of the string, it's checking if the, the hash code of the, of the state, let's say, is matching the, the hash code of the strings, and then, just in case there's a collision, it's actually doing a, a check with the string, just in case. Then it's, 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 a, it's setting a variable to, to the 0 or 1 in this case, and then it's doing another switch with uh, these values that we just got. I mean, it's not a big deal, it's not a big performance impact, but uh, at least I was quite surprised and shocked when, uh, when I saw how I was doing that. 
I don't know. I, I, I don't know why you cannot just check the strings directly or I don't know. Like a, another thing I would like to mention is uh, that we always have to measure. Even if, because I've been optimizing some algorithms sometimes and sometimes what seems obvious that it will be faster, for some reasons it, it isn't. Uh, I did once, I was working on a YUB to RGB conver converter. Okay? And I know Java is not the right language for that, but I think it proves, it proves my point. And uh, basically, this is how one of the U, uh, YUV frames looks like. So uh, U is the luminance, so how light or dark is the image, let's say, or the pixel. And then UV is the, is the, chroma, is the chroma of the, so the color, let's say, or, or the, of the pixel. As you can see, for every four values of Y, it's sharing two values of, uh, of chroma, which is a kind of optimized expression or transformation. <coughs> okay, if we look at the, at the stream of, of bytes we will get, we first get all the y's, then we get the u's, then we get the v's. Okay. I think this is well, not exactly uh, yuv 420. I think it's yuv 220 or something. I don't remember. But that's the one we get from the frames from the from the view from the viewfinder from from Android. We get it on that format. If we look just at the code, I will not explain with detail, but it's quite easy. So we just get the the yuv values. We transform them. So we you just we can look and we can play the formula, okay, and uh, we and we store the, the result, okay. This is something wrong. Here is is BGR instead of RGB. It's a small typo. Okay, things we can do here. So as you can know, uh, floating point operations are quite costly. So we can uh, use uh, fixed point operations. So anyone use fixed point? Okay. The others. Uh, do you know what's fixed point operations? Okay. I will just print that quickly. Uh, we can, as you can see, as we're sharing some uh, chroma values, we can reuse some of the calculations. There's no need to do that every time. We can share it with two pixels, for example. And we can use some pre calc tables to do all the computations as well. So this is the pre calc tables. For example, the case calculate computing all the values. And the floating values you used before, you, you saw before, uh, here you have the, the fixed point version. By fixed point, basically, you get the float value. You multiply it by uh, any power of 2, like 256, for example. You do all the operations with that number, and then at the end, you divide by 256. Okay? Division is also a costly operation, but you can use shifting. So that's the nice one. So you can have a lot, of pre a lot more precision, let's say, using just integers or longs. Okay, just getting all the values, just getting all the pre-cut tables, and then the resulting code is basically just, it's also, it's getting two pixels per, 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 for the same loop, but it's basically getting the two y's, it's getting the RGB from all the chromas and factors and everything, and then just writing the two pixels. So it's quite straightforward, no calculations on, on the inner loop. So do you think it's faster? No, that, that, was, a, that was a tricky question, yeah, it is. But <laughs> not always. Uh, it's, you look at normal, the optimized versus the, the optimized version, you can see it's always smaller, okay? And also it's, you can see there was an impact using ProGuard, I modified and reduced the, the file and optimized the right code by ProGuard. But do you see something wrong here, something weird? Yeah. I don't know what happens there. But when you, you, you compare it with Jack, it actually takes more time than the optimized version with, rather than the optimized version. I don't know, I guess there's some kind of penalty accessing uh, tables or something, but uh, honestly, I don't know. But that's the reason I said measure everything and don't assume a anything that uh, it will actually go faster. Okay, just talk about, just a bit about tooling. So in Java, you have the Java P. Java P is to de decompile classes, so you can just have any class and just decompile by using Java P and the command line and, and the class file. On Android, you can uh, do a text dump, it's on the, on the platform tools. So it will dump all the UDEX uh, bytecode and everything. You can get D8 and R8 from this Google URL. And you can get, you can compile it, and you can actually run it on, on command line if you want. If you want to enable D8 on, uh, on your Android Studio, there's a, there's, a key, there's a key you have to put in your Gradle properties. Uh, Krakatau is actually, it's an, an, an assembler, this assembler from bytecode. It's the one I used to actually do it manually and, and check if it was worth it or not. Also, uh, you want to see in art what's the resulting uh, optimized native code. 
uh, you can just pull the file using uh, these commands, or you can automatically dump it by just using IDVCL, blah, blah, blah. But you, you have to be very careful with the, where it actually will store the APK. And you can see, if you're using the application, it will actually, uh, you can see here is dash one, you can have to alternate dash one, dash two. So you have to be very careful which APK you're, you're getting. Also, on a desktop machine, you have the options to print assembly, and uh, it will actually print all the all the assembly code that is generated by the just-in-time compiler. Okay, and there's a nice talk by Alec Blue that uh, he did on on Java one that explains and covers the the just-in-time compiler and the hotspot on Java. It's quite recommended as well. And from Android point of view, we got uh, a talk from Jake Wharton for DroidCon London last year, I think. And uh, there's a blog post. And I think it was a quite a busy talk this morning about the, the hidden cost of Kotlin. So I recommend you to go there. One last thing. When doing performance measurements, be careful about the GAT. What do I mean? Uh, you run the same test multiple times. At one point, you will kick the GAT, it will optimize it. So at the end, oh, it's faster. Yeah, it will faster because it's optimized by the GAT. OK, uh, thank you very much. And some time for questions. Any other question? Okay, thank you.